So while you guys are listening to this one, again, I'm remote somewhere, probably on the ocean, might be on shore, <laughs> but I'm definitely, definitely doing something with the cameras right now while we're uh, sharing these emails. It's funny, you know, uh, the other day a friend of mine forwarded me some website where people go to talk trash, I guess. It's just amazing how many freaking angry evil people are out on the planet. This one attack and trash and attack and trash. Then you got to kick yourself in the ass for even going and reading that crap. But, you know, I'll tell you what, you guys, you know, we're always taught or told or advised to ignore things and they go away, ignore things, go away. But sometimes you do have to fight back. Sometimes you have to fight. Somebody's got to fight. You got to fight back sometimes. You know, as an example, like one, there's one website a handful of years ago that made a blatant post about me and a photograph of me. And they put some text in there. It was absolute lie but could possibly be damaging to my or anyone's character and uh, I've let it go for some time now and I've started to see people quoting it in other places and uh, I have a solid case I just haven't got around to it but I'm gonna uh, pretty soon here I'm gonna slap them about a million and a half dollar lawsuit I'm gonna sue their asshole off they got it coming but it's an example of you have to fight back sometimes you guys all right I'll keep you updated on what I'm going to do with that one because I'm going to thoroughly enjoy it. And it's unrelated to this topic, too. Anyway, that's my little rant of the morning as I'm on my second copy here. I better get to share it before I start babbling like a doorknob. Here we go. This is titled Unseen Force. Hello, Steve. Thank you for taking the time to read this and all your other great tales that have been shared on your channel by your viewers thus far. We appreciate you, Steve, and all the work you put into this topic. My name is Matt. It doesn't matter if you use my name. I'm a former Marine and police officer and currently working as a park ranger for a state agency. This, occur this incident occurred around 2005 in the back country of Mount Baldy Wilderness Area in the San Gabriel Mountains, located in San Bernardino County, California. My friend and I went up to this location and camped under the stars and hiked the back country at least once a week back there for years. It's not an easy, accessible location to get to due to difficult terrain and terrible road conditions that can make travel by vehicle pretty unforgiving. We made it to our campsite by day and started to set up camp for the coming days. With all the snow on the ground, it'd be, it would make finding extra firewood for the night pretty difficult. So we decided to make a monkey fist and throw a rope around a dead high branches and pull them down. This worked out pretty well and we made a lot of noise pulling them out of the trees, but we soon grew tired of that and found an old dead redwood tree that had fallen on the ground sticking up about seven feet or so off the ground. I walked up to the trunk to the high point, stood shoulder width apart and not moving on the large trunk holding with an axe chatting my friend out of nowhere. I'm flipped in the air upside down and now falling towards the rocks below. What? I hit a branch on the way down. Actually, let me read that one more time. <clears throat> I walked up to the trunk of the high point. I walked up the trunk to the high point, stood shoulder width apart and not moving. On the large trunk, holding an ax, chatting with my friend, and out of nowhere, I am flipped in the air, upside down, and now falling towards the rocks below. I hit a branch on the way down that gouged into my ribs and slammed onto the rocks. I was in total shock. I looked at my friend standing over me in total disbelief. He looked as if he'd seen a ghost. He reached for my hand, but when he grabbed me, I felt pins and needles all over my body. I told him to let me lay for a while and rest until I feel better. He told me there is no way that what he saw could have happened the way it did. He said, it looked like someone or some force threw both my legs over my head. There was no ice or snow on the trunk and I had solid footing. It felt like a great force just took my legs out from underneath me. My friend was shook up pretty bad by what he saw, but it didn't end there. I finally felt good enough to get off those cold rocks and take some of the branches back to camp. The axe took a long time chopping up the wood, so we used large rocks to break the branches into smaller pieces instead. While doing so, I was struck in the knee by a flying log that took a nice chunk out of my knee. Lucky for snow, I jammed it right in there. It seemed to me we were just having a bit of a bad luck, not anything else. That night made we made a big fire. The temperature was a brisk 10 degrees. 
and we were standing there chatting, when from the darkness, large rocks were being thrown at the fire towards us. We didn't hear any movement coming out of the forest, or any sign of anyone, as we stood there, baffled at what ore could have thrown such large rocks from pitch-black wilderness. We were nailed with more of them. That did it for me. We fired back with the wrist rocket we had, and we went through a whole pack of bearings, one after the other, but we heard the bearings hit trees, and then it went silent. We stayed up for a couple more hours, contemplating who the hell would be out here in 10 degree in the backcountry, at the base of a 10,000 foot mountain, throwing rocks at armed strangers in the night. We were baffled. We decided to pack it in for the night, and see what we could sleep off this weird night, but it wasn't over yet. I was sound asleep in the back of the truck. We had a tarp over the bed and kept it fully enclosed while we slept to keep the wind at bay. I awoke to what I can only describe as loud scampering or running around our vehicle. It was jarring and disturbing to say the least. The only feeling I felt was dread. I slept with my 45 for peace of mind, but I didn't feel it would have done much good. I laid there quietly wondering if it would stop when my friend whispered out, Do you hear that? Just then, all the scampering ended. You could hear a pin drop. I told him in a quick, stern voice, Great, now they know. I quickly got the nerve to open the flap, pistol ready, and nothing. Nothing was out there. Nothing. Just the cold howl of the wind. We woke early to check a perimeter for any signs of what or who could have been out there. There was no one around anywhere. We didn't find cougar tracks. We did find cougar tracks fresh in the snow 200 yards from our camp, but no signs of anything else. We looked around our truck for tracks, but we had walked around the truck so many times we could not see any visible signs of anything. The snow around the truck was packed down pretty heavy from the footsteps. We decided we were not going to spend another night in that area. We told ourselves we would never go back to that location, and we never did. Out of all the times we stayed there, the only thing that visited us that night was a large bear. I haven't heard of any stories of anyone seeing the keeper of the forest in that area, and nor did I think it was a being until I heard all the stories from your viewers and David Plattis' missing 411 cases, and the semi-transparent being that has been talked about. Whatever happened out there is a mystery to us. I have to be honest, I've always thought there would be an explanation for what happened, or it could be easily explained away, but I've changed my mind since. I'm not afraid to go into the wilderness. I think whatever it was that day was just giving us a warning. A lot of people in that area can go into that region and really make a mess of it. They used to leave trash and even graffiti at times on the rocks. I guess if I was a big hairy monster that ruled the forest, I wouldn't be too kind to those I met up with out there who desecrated the land I lived on either. Too bad I'm not one of those people, and I kind of agree with him on that. I think you're right, Steve. Some day, I hope we will learn from each other and the experiences gathered by these events and gain more insight on, the elusive, on this elusive being. Thanks for keeping your words, Steve. That means a lot in this day and age. I'm with you. Can't say I'd care to meet up with them on a dark night in the woods either. No thanks. Stay in the fight. You're not alone. Sincerely, Matt W. Matt, thanks for that email, man. And uh, I think that's probably one of the few emails in of something actually physically attacking somebody, assaulting them like that. Like there was that one a while back. Those two guys were uh, doubling on the quad and something flipped the quad from behind up and over top. It like spun them around in midair or whatever the hell happened. Remember that one? I guess there's been a handful, hasn't there? But being absolutely flipped in the air like that off of a stump or a log, holy shit. That's a bit of a ruthless move as well, though, isn't it? You know, they didn't want you to sink that axe into that stump or whatever reason. Glad you're all right and you get paralyzed or anything. Or worse, right? All right, moving along. All right, what do we got? Titled. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> Your rule number one, if something is locked on you, is the title of the email. You are so right on the mark. You are so right on the mark with your rule number one, if something is locked on you. Too many people out in the bush don't understand that and delay taking action or take action when they didn't need to. With Sabe and the various animals, delaying or not recognizing the need for action can be disastrous, as can the second, if you do something unnecessary that provokes an attack like shooting at Sabe when you didn't have to, or ignoring a warning to leave or back off. 
Given the wide scope of SAB encounters and with encounters occurring both out in the bush and around and in town, people need to know the difference between point when we are in immediate danger versus when we're being scared off or chased off. They're just monitoring. Oh, here comes my token helicopter oh. over the frickin' house, right? It's always loud to me. I know it's not loud to you guys on this mic. When they are just monitoring or leaving or what we are doing. They're gathering food from forests, orchards, or fields. Or adults or juveniles are just messing with us, learning or curious. Is it possible to give a comprehensive instructions on that? As in, how to tell the difference between their pacing us to monitor our leaving or activities versus being stalked? Hint. Given the consequences, if you're wrong, leave now. But there are some obvious indicators that shouldn't need explaining, like rocks flying at your head. But there's a lot of people with limited experience in the bush who aren't aware of the locked-on rule. Or perhaps they heard it in one form or another, but forgot or are hesitant to recognize or hesitant to act upon it. Your version of rule number one, if something is locked on you, is a wonderfully clear and simple explanation without getting lost in discussions on behavioral science. It offers a clear and reliable rule that indicates from something most likely intends you harm through to here it comes. With some animals, there may be mock charges, but you need to be knowledgeable on their behavior and be capable of judging it, and then judge and act correctly. Fun being in the rear of a van in Africa where you could get crunched in a limited attack, calling out the nuances in a charging elephant's behavior so the driver can judge when to hold his ground versus when to move away. And there's rule number two with predators. Run and you'll be acting like prey. It triggers predators to do what predators do. Given the importance for people to know your rule number one, perhaps it should be repeated every four to five videos. Actually, pretty much everyone would benefit if you make a separate, simple short video from, I feel strongly this video needs to be seen as by as many as possible. From 40.09, for all you people out there, to 41.35, you're a dummy not to. Simple, clear, nothing else in that video to distract anyone from that message. Perhaps call it, for all you people out there, rule number one, locked on. From then on, you could a mention that locked on video in any video as a reminder and put the link to that video in the description area of every video and in the about section of your channel. Easy for people to find instead of searching for something within a video and getting distracted. And in the comments, people can refer and link to it in the response to comments. In addition to helping people protect themselves, it would, be generate, it would generate more views, which can bring more people to the channel to get information and decide for themselves. Regards, Michael. P.S. You could even make a new non sabe version for your hunting channel. Perhaps for the audience, for that audience, include more of an introduction to recognize a predator behavior, both in general and by common species. A lot of hunters and other people going out in the bush would likely appreciate that. P.S.S. You could make or edit your videos to get another short video. I just read them. You decide for yourself. Gives people a give gives people a video to post the link to in your comments when some idiot takes a bird. Again, more views. <laughs> PSSS. I've used rule number one in two additional different ways. To get something coming too close to me to move off, stare at it, lower my head, to turn face to direct at it, crouch in a tiny bit. Sometimes requires a slow, careful step or two before they get the message. When they start to back off, you stand up, ending your stalk to indicate you recognize they're backing off. I'm using to see some animals start when they suddenly realize what you're doing. Some will turn and run a few steps and stop and look back to see if you're chasing them. I get the impression they don't hear me chasing them, so they want to need to know what is up. Once that flight is triggered in them, it seems to take quite a bit before they turn on a flight response off. Some will stand there twitching, a few quivering, as if to try to decide whether or not to run. My take is the twitching are, are trying to decide. The quivering have adrenaline rush while they, while they try to decide. They usually end up heading away, with or without hops to look back. Careful what, when, and where you do that. You don't want to provoke an attack. In Africa, remember that, that to lions, in a day, humans are usually predators. At night, you're the prey. They'll stare at you often during the day or pretend they're not, but they're always aware. They may be assessing you, so a stare in return may detour that, or may even detour it 
daytime charge if you stand your ground, but don't provoke an attack with a challenging stare. You need to know how to read them. There's a reason they don't want tourists or city folk going walkabout without an experienced guide. Moving out among deer by not staring at them, not facing, not, nor moving directly at them. Move in the open, pausing often, looking up and around, including at each of them or a tiny movement and at any other animals around, then facing down again. Even paw at the ground of the foot and then move toward again. Not predator behavior. Easy to read when they get uncomfortable. So you know what they'll tolerate that day. All right. There you go. Some helpful hints, tips shared with the people. I was thinking, actually, actually I was thinking about that the other day. I think we've got enough information now. It might be time to do a bit of a a, uh, a recap of a lot of the information taken from hundreds of these experiences and maybe make a list um, of importance for the people to review and read and to hold on to between their ears, right? I think that would be a good idea. You're pretty quick, just need the time to do it. But I have a feeling there's probably some people out there in the listener group that has probably already done this or is doing it right now. If you have and you want to share, if you're ready to share it yet, um, please do. There's going to be a lot of people going to benefit from it. All right, here we go. What's this one? A young juvenile likes to watch, loves to watch me cook. Holy shit, all right, this ought to be different. Hey Steve, me again. I'm the guy from Sasquatch and New Locations. Second story at six minutes. I said I would send in my encounter that happens behind my home. A few months ago, I was cooking some of my V8 burgers on the grill, and I got a feeling I was being watched. I looked up the hill behind my home, and there was a young juvenile black five and one half foot male standing there swaying side to side looking at me. He stood there for maybe five minutes, then walked 20 feet to the right and stopped started swaying again side to side again. Steve, I was not at all afraid. I was kind of amused. I knew my wife would not believe me, so I called to her to come and see for herself. Well, she was caught up in some romantic movie, and I couldn't get her to see this young Sabe watching me. I don't know to this day why I never even thought of grabbing my phone to take a few pics. Like you say, most people wouldn't believe the pics if I did take some. But anyway, Steve, I was so grateful this young juvenile like the smell of my spicy V8 burgers. I've been texting with a few H2H family members and they've been asking me to send in this encounter. I've tried this time to put in proper grammar and punctuations, but hell, writing isn't my forte. I'm so grateful that you have opened this forum for everyone to get this out in the open. My belief is that our so-called government will not recognize the species because if they were protected, then the lands that they reside on could not be developed, thus for causing millions of dollars lost in the elite's pockets. It always boils, boils down to dollars. Stephen, sorry for the loss of your beautiful horse, Mr. Macaroni. The bond between a man, a human, and a horse is something that cannot be compared to. My new family members here at HTH is my favorite part of my day. The people I've met has your back to the end. As I, as I do, I would take on Satan himself and help you, brother. You've started something that, that cannot and will not be stopped. I'll keep this short as you have many other people more importantly than me. God bless you, Steve. I'll give you anything to hang out and talk about this world is headed to. I think we have a good idea now that the ball is rolling. If you're ever in Ashland, Kentucky, email me and I'll and I'll let you meet this young juvenile. Thanks again, my new friend. All right, man. James, thanks for that share, man. And uh, I'd be curious to know if you gave him one of those patties. You know, if you gobbled it up or, or what's going down. Man, funny how the coffee gets cold when you don't stop reading, right? Also curious about uh, the other ones that may be with it. If they're revealing them, letting you, letting you see them or not. It'd be interesting to know. It's kind of funny, you know, I've, I've talked to other people who have um, lengthy experience with these beings and they have cautioned against giving them food. They think it's a bad idea. I think I probably tend to, tend to agree... Like the other day for me, I was in one of my favorite places and I'm avidly searching for a specific set of deer antlers that have fallen off a specific buck. And I know every trail on this mountain. And uh, this is just for me, but I'll share it with you guys. But I, uh, one of his antlers from two years ago was left in the middle of the main trail. And I am the only person on this mountain. I have been for years. I've had up a 20 some odd trail cameras on this mountain for years. I've never had another human being on the trail camera, but... 
that antler was placed there. Could a coyote have done it? For sure. Wolf? For sure. Would a coyote or a wolf pick up a two-year-old shed antler and pack it and then place it in dead center in the middle of the trail? Yeah, chances are pretty slim. But anyway, for me, my gut's telling me somebody put that sucker there for me. And I thought about it. I was, I was actually, for the first time in my life, I thought, well, what the hell, maybe I'll go dump, hang a bag of apples 12 feet off the ground for whoever did that and call it even. And then I thought about it again, and I thought, nah, I'm good. I don't need to spark up some kind of uh, relationship or whatever the hell you want to go at. I'm good. I just want to be left alone in my mountainous forest in paradise and not be stressed out or followed or had shit thrown at me. So I passed on that myself. Anyway, what do we got here? Here's another one. Thanks again for sending that in, man. And if I am nearby, I will definitely look you up and I'll come over and, and we'll have a good bullshit for certain. And I'll be down around there again soon, as soon as this border bullshit clears up. Hey, Steve, been following since before the Sabbay stuff. Love the content. I figured everyone else is sharing, so I may as well share my story. Not nearly as exciting as some, but maybe someone else can relate. No need to use my name, sir. So here we go. I'm an avid bull hunter for white-tailed deer. In particular, I love to hunt the big woods in northern Michigan. Always a challenge and better than sitting in a cornfield edge, in my opinion. In 2018, I took my yearly week-long trip north to hunt. I always go the last week of October or the first week of November. This week I went, Halloween fell in the middle of the week. I had two areas I was focused on and hunted one or the other according to wind direction. These stands are about three-eighths of a mile apart. One was a hang-on style and the other I used for... I used my climbing stand. I was especially excited about where the climbing stand was located as I found a fresh line of scrapes along an old logging road. I had hunted at the beginning of the week. It was uneventful. And after Tuesday morning's hunt, I headed for home to take the kids trick-or-treating. I had left both stands in the woods as the area is pretty remote. I hadn't seen another hunter or anyone else all week. I returned to camp on Thursday morning, and with the wind direction, I went to the second stand location with the hang-on. Nothing that night. But with a wind change in the forecast, I was pumped to get back in the climber. The next morning, I woke in. I walked in early, no headlamp. And when I got to the climber, I was pretty puzzled. There were three branches, maybe wrist or forearm sized, and three to four feet long, laying across my stand. I remember being really confused and wondering how the hell those would break and fall perfectly like that. But the hunt must go on, so up I went and I hunted a beautiful fall Michigan morning. I got down about ten. To head back to the truck. I took the old logging road back for easier walking and this is where I really got confused. On my way out I checked one of the fresh scrapes. On it were broken branches laying perpendicular to one another like three layers all perpendicular to one another. I looked around to see where they had been broken from and could not find the tree in question. Now I was really pissed and thinking someone was messing with me but if that was the case why they didn't steal my $300 climbing stand it wasn't chained or locked and who would it be? I had not seen a soul out there since I got there. I hunted one more day there and blew an opportunity at a nice buck, then pulled out of there. Another thing to note, I had a trail cam near the climbing stand facing it. And when I pulled out, I checked the card and found a few deer and me getting in and out of my climber, but nothing else. Interesting for sure. I know this is a weird situation, but dismissed soon after I got home. Not fast forward to summer 2020, we took the kids and the dog for a walk in the same area. We were near the same old logging road, so I steered us that way and wanted to show my wife the area of that encounter. As well, I mean, as we went, my son and I were in the lead and cut kitty corner through the woods at two-track intersection. My wife and daughter were trailing behind when I heard my wife say, What the heck is this? Who runs around out here barefoot? So I went back, and sure enough, where the DNR had dozed up a blockade to the road, there was a footprint in the sand. It was the ball of a foot like you're running and we're going to use the sand hill to jump off. Funny thing, that was the only print we found. Not very big, maybe a size 10 -ish. Once I saw that, it was a serious light bulb moment. No feelings of fear or even being uneasy, but my puzzle came together that instant. I gave the old saying of, it is what it is, and we carried on. I still go back there and hunt, but I assure you my head's on a swivel at all times. My family and I also saw a UFO near this area, three glowing balls of light in a triangle formation the summer before. But I know that is off topic, so I'll let that one be. Thanks for what you do, Steve, and keep it up. 
Hopefully my grammar and punctuation is okay. LOL. I watched your video today, June 14, 21, and thought to offer an idea. What about Sarah to help reading emails? Maybe even just have those beautiful backgrounds as she reads. Just a thought. Thanks again. All right, man. Thanks for that email. Thanks for sending that in. And uh, for me, if I found those sticks on my stand, if I, if I had a stand, for me, what I know, what I've seen, I'd be like, all right, I'm good. I'm out of here. I'd probably never go back. <laughs> That's just me, though. Kind of like when I found my big stand tore down, which I was talking about the other day. Uh, a friend of mine was asking me, when are you going to go back to that to the stand and go pull that that trail camera where I hung the meat 12 feet in the air, 10 feet, whatever it is. But I was hoping to get uh, as many grizzly bears and predators on there as I could. So what is it now? It's June... I think we're June 13th or something. And uh, the bears are, the bear rut is really kicking in gear right now. And they're going to rip it up all the way through July. So I'll probably leave that thing in there until at least the end of July. Or who knows, maybe even later. But it is, it is, uh, sometimes it's tough to leave those things and not go check. But anyway, thanks again for sending that in, man. And uh, you come across anything else worthy of sharing or might help somebody here, make sure you send it in, all right? And be safe out there. And good luck getting those monster bucks up north there. I'm sure there's some big deer around there. I know that. It's exciting. Paralyzed by a feeling of total terror and doom. Hey, Steve, here's my experience. In 1974, I was 14 years old, traveling from Montana to California via the Lewis and Clark Trail through Idaho. Dad, Mom, my older sister, and I, along with our family dash hound, we stopped for the night at Bay Horse Lake in the Chalice National Forest. We were the only campers, and my dad was excited to fish, as the lake was active with top-feeding trout. It was my job to pitch a military-style canvas tent and get firewood. Mom was making food, and after putting up the tent, my sister and I took the dog just south of the campsite to gather the fallen wood that was plentiful. We'd gone only 50 yards from camp and were about to cross a very small running creek when our dog simply stopped, fixed gaze forward, no barking. I was walking ahead and my sister, 17 years of age, when we were both started to smell a foul odor. I decided there must be something dead up ahead of us and moved forward looking intently for the source. My sister stopped cold, saying we should turn around. At the same time, at the same moment, I became paralyzed and overwhelmed by a feeling of total terror and doom. I could not move forward, and I was terrified to turn around. My sister, now 10 years behind, said, We should go back now. But I could not get myself to turn around. I was compelled to keep looking forward, as I felt I would die if I turned around. I stood for what seemed like forever, but must have been only moments, looking for the source of the smell and the feelings, all the while thinking that I might die at any moment and realizing how crazy it was. Our dog simply turned around and started back to camp. My sister had started moving backwards, and I realized that I could finally move my legs, stepping backwards, but still facing forward. I continued to move backwards, and the feeling of doom and terror began to subside. I finally turned around and headed back to camp, and reported that I couldn't get any firewood. Just about that time, my dad arrived back at camp, announcing that fishing was no good, which was odd since... I was not yet sundown, and he was a die-hard fisherman. We all ate in silence that night, not discussing the odd contrast of the beauty and the fear that seemed to be around us. We headed right to bed inside our big canvas tent, no fire. At around 3 a.m., we were all awake and hearing noises coming from the direction my sister had been looking for firewood. The noises, crackling branches and rocks moving, continued. Finally, my dad announced, let's get the hell out of here, which might have been the scariest part since that confirmed in my mind that something was terribly wrong and even my dad was scared. We opened the tent did not see anything, so we quickly took a park camp, threw everything in the car before a sunup, and felt relieved to be driving away. I am now 60 years old. I still have never felt terror like I felt that day. My parents have both since passed, but I did discuss the incident with my father, who claimed to not remember any details. I've also discussed with my sister. Collectively, we simply remember that it was as scary as hell. Appreciate your website and content. Keep up the good work, Stan. Stan, thank you so much for, for that share. Um, Somebody is going to be able to relate to it big time, obviously. We've had the same flavor of email in numerous times now. And sometimes I wonder if that, I wonder if that's just 
you're just like a half a step away from a portal, possibly. Possibly is what I'm thinking when I hear these these uh, experiences. But it's that terror. The terror feeling is just... You know what? I'm actually getting so interested. I'm so curious about that projected absolute terror in your soul that I'm almost 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 um wanting to experience that myself I want to in a funny way I kind of want to experience that absolute terror in my soul without seeing or hearing anything to investigate it myself you know what I mean in a weird way <laughs> I probably would regret it big time but it's just an odd odd thing it's, it's happened way too many times so it is for my mind it is fact and I want to know more about it I don't know what's up is it a warning or is it it's either a warning from something or it's us warning us from something. It's one of the two and nothing else. And I want to know what it is. But anyway, keep sending them in, you guys. Everybody's learning. Everybody's learning rapidly. It's a good thing. Be safe out there. Thanks again for sending that email in, my man. Be safe and enjoy your life.